Um, I really am so grateful to get to be here. Um, I love the city. This is uh, such one of the greatest cities in the world, and uh, I just feel so uh, grateful to get to be here today in this moment. Um, I want to preach this sermon that is, um, the first few minutes are just very personal update on my life. I know so many of you have been wondering, Clay, what are you up to, you know? I'm kidding. I know so many of you are like, we don't care what you're up to. And uh, no, I, but I, I'm just going to tell you uh, uh, just what God has been doing in my own personal life. And then I want to preach this message on Psalm 23, which um, one of the most powerful, amazing, just the, the, just the literature alone. This is such a ridiculous piece of literature, but I believe it's also God's inspired Word, and I hope that maybe he'll use it in your life the way he has used it in my life. If you have a Bible, you can just turn there to Psalm 23, or if you use technology, um, I love the Bible app. Particularly, do y'all ever let the British guy read you the Bible app? <laughs> that dude, I'm like, voice of heaven, you know? Like, I am grateful that the American Revolution happened. I don't know if it was a God-glorifying thing or not. I'm grateful that it happened. But man, this dude can read the Bible. So um, Psalm 23, just put your finger there if you would. So... Um, 1998, 1998, I moved to Atlanta, Georgia. I grew up in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Grew up in a family of Jesus' parents. Okay, what is that? Okay, are you rolling with the tide? What's happening back there? You're just yelling for Alabama. You know, wherever you go, you just name states and people scream. It's awesome. Um, I grew up in Alabama, moved to Atlanta, Georgia to go to Georgia Tech. I studied engineering, industrial engineering there. I struggled to graduate. It was very quick. It uh, did not take long for me to learn this is not what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. Uh, I had a really hard time getting through all the physics curriculum there, and I needed to get done with this one class because it was a prerequis prerequisite for some other classes. And so I went to the registrar, and they said, what are you planning on? She, this lady, I remember she had cats all over her office, not live ones, but pictures of them. And I remember her telling me, she said, what are you, what are you planning? She asked me, she said, what are you planning on doing with this? And I said, well, I've, I've really gotten involved with this church, and I'm going to go into ministry. And she was like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And I was like, that is such a great question that I asked myself on the daily. Thank you. Um, and and I convinced her, I said, listen, if you give me this degree, I promise you, I will never use it, okay? We will make this trade that will be so good for you, all right? I can promise you that. And so she did, uh, they eventually did let me get into the class. I ended up graduating, I moved to Dallas, Texas, where I met my shout hey. Um, uh, I love Tim telling his story about meeting his lady friend. I met uh, my wife, Jenny, at Dallas Theological Seminary uh, just after I met Ben Stewart and Donna, which was... Um, uh, uh, and also an awesome experience. It was wonderful. It was just happened to be one was slightly better than the other one. But um, she is, uh, she's a Texan. She's from Texas. And we got married. Uh, as been mentioned, we have five kids. Uh, she can't keep her hands off of me. Uh, that's a side note. Um, we, uh, we live in Atlanta now. And I've been serving at this church for, it has been uh, about 20 years. And I would have said, I still would say, for me, it, w it is and was my dream job. I don't know if any of you are working in your dream job, but that's a really amazing thing that God would bless you with this privilege of getting to serve in a place where you, you know, the whole like, if, if, it's, if, you, if you love it, then you never ever have to go to work, right? I mean, that's the way I felt. Like I loved it so much. I never felt like I was going to work. I mean, it was a joy to get to do it. But over the last couple of years, I started experiencing this. I, I use the term professional restlessness, uh, have any of you ever experienced professional restlessness, you know, where you're going, I, I, I mean, I'm, I, I don't know what this is. I, I feel like I'm, is, is this like I'm supposed to do something different? Is this I'm, I'm supposed to just double down and enjoy it more? Or is there something going on? Do I need to get a new role? Do I need to go back to school? What, today's really, uh, hopefully, what I think God may want to do is try to help us with these seasons of transition, of how do we keep our soul sane when we're in seasons of transition, when we're in seasons of change. That's what I hope God might do today. That's what he's been doing in my life. Because it started to become more and more apparent the more I prayed about it, the more I talked to my wife about it, the more I had, I actually had some friends that sat down with me and did like an intervention. This was scary, but they were like, not drug use or anything, people, all right? So back off, you know, with the judgment. Um, they, they looked at me and they were like, hey, we don't feel like you're operating at your full self. We've seen you really passionate about what you're doing. And uh, they said, what percentage do you think you're 
out. I was like, I don't know, like 80. And they're like, we were thinking more like 60. And I was like, rude. Um, but, but thank you for the, the love and the encouragement and honestly, and the challenge. And so they really challenged me with what I was doing. It was a remarkable. It was like a half day experience where we just talked about where, where I saw myself going, what I thought God was doing. And then uh, month after month after month, I just kept experiencing this. And I would tell my wife about it. She finally got so tired of talking. She's like, what? Do, do something. Do something about it, right? Don't just talk about it. So I started, I looped my boss in. I looped the senior pastor of our church in. And I said, hey, I, can we talk about this? I, I think I'm, uh, it, th- this job is, this job is great, but I don't know if this job is right. That's a big deal. When you feel like th- no, there's nothing wrong with the job, I don't know that it's right for me. But you see, the worst part though, <laughs> the worst part was, but I didn't know what was next. I didn't know what was on the other side. Have you ever noticed this? How sometimes God, he calls you into something or calls you out of something without showing you what's on the other side. And that's what I was feeling, which was so scary. So I'm telling my dad about this one day, I'm on the phone with him. I was like, dad, I was so nervous to tell him because um, quitting a job is not the worst thing in the world to me. But quitting a job is the worst thing in the world to my father. And so um, one of the pieces of advice he gave me, he said, hey, can I just tell you this one piece of advice? I was like, yeah, sure, dad, what's up? And he said, don't ever quit a job until you have a job. Sound like what a dad would say, doesn't it? You know, a loving father, a good, good father. And so I was like, all right, got it, dad, I won't. Well, I went into my boss's office the next month and I said, hey, I just want to let you know that I'm here to resign, And I had never resigned from a job. This is the first job that I had had after graduating from graduate school. A lot of you have resigned from multiple jobs. You're like, I was was working at Witch Witch the other day and I just resigned. Like, this is easy. You just walk in and be like, I'm done, deuces. You know, like for me, this was like a big thing. And as the words were coming out of my mouth, I couldn't even believe it. Uh, the, uh, the, maybe two weeks later, um, no, it was a month later, we were in the car, in the van, all the kids were in the back. I think we we're headed to the zoo or something like that. And, uh, it was a Saturday. The next day was a Sunday. And my wife leaned over and she said, I think you ought to tell the kids. And I was like, why so soon? And she was like, because they're announcing it at church tomorrow. And I was like, that's, gosh, you are so wise, you know? <laughs> How do you do this so often? So I thought, you know what? This is a good time. Everybody's facing forward. Uh, no, we don't have to make any eye contact. You know, it's the best way to have conversations with children. And so it's the best way for the children to have conversations with adults. And so I said, hey, everybody, I got something I want to tell you. You know, everybody looks up from their thing, whatever they're doing. And I said, hey, I I'm, um, I'm, uh, feel like God is leading us. And uh, I'm my... Jenny, your mom and I have been, they, I don't, they don't call her Jenny, they call her mommy, but I was like, we've been praying about it a lot, and I think God's leading us to um, make a change, and immediately, one of them was like, are we changing schools? I was like, no. Are we moving? No. Okay, cool, dad, thanks, and they just immediately, like, went back to what they were doing, and I was, but one child, one lone child, who I love the most, um, <laughs> is my favorite. I'm kidding, but um, seriously, she uh, started crying, and through tears said, but you love your job. And I said, you're right. I do love my job. So then what's up? And I I was still new. So I didn't, you know, new in this. I was like, I don't even know. So she said, what are you going to do? And I start trying to explain it. Even as I'm listening to myself, I'm like, this makes no sense. Like, clearly, I don't know. She's still crying. I was like, are you, you're still crying. What's up? And she's like, well, it sounds like you're quitting your job. It sounds like you don't have a job. I was like, I don't need this. I don't need this from you. Okay. I'm getting it from a lot of people. I don't need it from you right now, all right? But you are so right, okay? So I um, went through this season. Uh, I had been reading, I'm, I'm in, in the men's group that I'm in, or we read the Bible uh, together and we'll text each other every day. We do the soap thing that a lot of you passion people do. And we'll text each other just one thing that God's teaching us through it. And we were reading through Psalms and we had gotten through uh, a couple months before this, we'd gotten through to about Psalm 22 and then we hit Psalm 23. And God had used this Psalm. I couldn't get past it. I mean, every day I'm reading it. Every day, really just the first verse, I'm reciting it over and over again because of how much God used this in my life. And so I just want to process with you. I just want to tell you, I just want to walk through this Psalm together and I want to just talk about, let's, let's listen to God's word. Let's hopefully listen to God's voice. And let's see what, what might he want to teach us about what we're walking through. Because some of you are walking through a similar season. Some of you are thinking about changing a job. Some of you are wondering, am I living in the right place? Some of you are wondering, God, I don't see the future. And I'm trusting that you have a future for me, but I can't see it. 
And so I want to just walk through the psalm together to determine, well, what, what does he want to say to us? What does he want to do? What does he want to show us? What does he want to teach us about himself and about seasons like this? So let's just, um, we'll read the whole thing from top to bottom together, and then we'll walk back through it a verse at a time. Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is, uh, they cut my mic off. They were like, is he done? He took a pause. Is he done? I'm going to keep going. That's cool. Um, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That first line, uh, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing is so perplexing to me because for me, there's a lot that I lack. What, what, what about you? What is it that you lack? I, I would imagine you're very well acquainted with what you lack. Maybe you don't see what's in the future. Maybe you're single and you want to be married. Maybe you're married and you wish you had kids. Maybe you're in the middle of a season where you're thinking, gosh, should, am I doing the right thing? Should I be changing something? Should I be moving somewhere different? I don't, maybe you don't have the money to be able to do it. Maybe you don't have the job that you want. Maybe there's a busted relationship with a parent. But all, all of us lack something, right? I mean, we all lack something. For me, I was so well acquainted with what I lack. I mean, I, for the longest time when I'm reading this, I'm going, I lack the courage to step out. I know I need to. It's great, but it's not right. And it's so clear to me, but I'm not courageous enough to step out because I don't know what's next. I lack the wisdom to know, well, what am I supposed to be doing? What should I be doing? I, I, so much of, so much need, so much of, so much lack. And over and over again, I would just recite that line. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Why, why shepherd? I mean, David, anybody in here ever spent time around sheep? Okay, great. Sometimes I do. I've done this a couple times, and there's a couple people that are just like, yeah, just like I grew up on a farm. I'm like, oh, you should come do this. All right. I, I've never really been around sheep. Um, but what I know is that David was a shepherd, so he had this season of life where he was out with the sheep, and supposedly he was good at it. Supposedly he was a, he was a protector. He was really um, strong. He was wise. He knew what to do. A shepherd is a very caring, loving, a very, um, it's a position of guidance. And he knew what he was doing. And, and these sheep, these sheep in general, they need it, right? And in this case, in, in this little verse that he says, the Lord is my shepherd, he's saying God is in the role of the shepherd, which makes us the sheep, right? Now, what do you know about sheep? Give me some adjective. Dumb. Thank you. What's your name? Jackie. I didn't call you dumb. Jackie called you dumb. Okay? Just to be clear. <laughs> Jackie said, you are the sheep and you are... She said, I said, what do we know about sheep? And she said, dumb. All right? <laughs> Why do we know that about sheep? Why is that like the first thing we know about sheep? Like no one said like fluffy, those things, they are so fluffy. No one said that. No one said like mischievous, some crazy sheep, they're getting all kinds of trouble. No one said that. I said, tell me about sheep. And with a resounding voice, you all, Jackie being the leader, said dumb. <laughs> that you are dumb. I don't think God's trying to call us dumb, okay? Jackie is, but God's not. 
okay? I think what he's trying to say is you have to know your role. You got to know your role. Don't get in somebody else's lane. Swim in your lane. And if you're trying to lead your own life, he's saying you're not good at that. Don't do that because you can't. You will miss out on something. You'll get yourself in trouble. You'll lead yourself the wrong way. You need, you need a shepherd. And David said, I got one. The Lord is, what's that word? My shepherd, pronoun. He's not a shepherd. He's not the shepherd. The Lord is, he's my shepherd. He is my personal shepherd. He's the one that leads me. I have days where I try to lead myself and it gets me into trouble. I get lost. I get, in, I get hung up in some briar patches. I scrape my head. I mess myself up. I step in a ditch. I've done all kinds of dumb things because I'm a sheep, but I've got a shepherd. And so I keep my eyes on not some other shepherd. I keep my eyes on my shepherd. And when I do that, I lack nothing. Now, did David lack something? Sure. I'm sure he had all kinds of lack, just like we have things that we lack. But he says, when I've got the shepherd, I don't actually lack anything. I have everything that I need. But what if you don't have something and you're like, it's something that I actually need? Well, maybe you don't need it yet. See, as a loving shepherd... Maybe he provides us what we need when we need it. But the question is, 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 he, is he your shepherd? Not, not is he your mom's shepherd or your granddad's shepherd or he's, a, he's my friend's shepherd. No, would you say he's my shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd and I lack nothing. And, and then look at what he does. He does these four interesting things there in the next two verses. He, he makes me, he makes me, I don't know why he has to make us, but he makes us lie down in green pastures. Uh, I don't lie down in green pastures very well. I like progress. I like activity. I like being on the go. I like movement. I see a lot of head shaking because that is you as well. Some of you are men of leisure, women of leisure, and you love a green pasture. Others of you, you're like, no, nah, I got to be working. I like progress. I like movement. I like to go. Me too. My mother-in-law makes fun of me because uh, she heard me talk about this verse a couple months ago, and she texted my wife and said, why is he talking about the green pasture? He doesn't know nothing about the green pasture. And so now whenever I play in golf, I text her pictures, and I'm like, I'm just out here in the green pastures, just laying down, out here just laying down. She's like, you need to get a job. That's what you need to do, Okay. Enough with the green pastures. You need to get a job. I don't know why he has to make us lie down in the green pastures. I think because we think if we're laying down in the green pastures, we're not getting anywhere. We're not getting stuff done. But what we don't understand is that sometimes, just like machines, you know how machines, sometimes to get them to reboot, what do you have to do? Turn them off. And maybe God knows, see, you don't understand. You think that you got to keep moving to get more energy, but I want to replenish you and restore you. And the only way to do that is to get you to lay down. And when you're laying down, the only thing you have is me. And you got to trust me. You got to trust me that I'm going to take care of you. And so lay down. We, 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 we're, we're instructed we got to lay down. He makes us do it. And then he says he leads us. He leads me beside quiet waters so that we can get replenished, so we can get what we need. Then he refreshes my soul. He refreshes my soul. Y'all know that song uh, that Boston sang called More Than a Feeling? You're not more than a feeling. To most people, you're just a feeling. You, you, here's what I mean. You ever had somebody that call you and their name pops up? What'd you do? Well, you have three options, right? You can answer it. Like if, if you, you felt them, in that moment, you felt them. You're like, oh, cool, he's calm. Oh, cool, she's calm. And, and, and you felt them and you liked the feeling. And so you answered it. Sometimes you were feeling something else and so you let it go to voicemail. And some of you have been feeling something real bad and you sent them to voicemail. <laughs> because we're a feeling. 
to other people. Other people feel you. Other people, and what they feel, they feel, usually they feel the state of your soul. And when your soul is weary and you've become cynical and critical and frustrated, they feel you. Some of you are tired and you, your soul feels discouraged. It feels beat up. Other people feel it. What's scary, though, is that nobody can take care of your soul for you. Your soul is your responsibility. I don't know if you've ever tried to care for your soul. It's not easy to care for your soul. And the good shepherd, David said, my shepherd, he refreshes my soul. He takes my soul and he makes it better. He fills it back up again. He gives me new mercies in the morning. He takes my energy and he replenishes it. He fixes those wounds where I've been hurt. He refreshes my soul. Would you let him do that? Would you let him refresh your soul? He wants to. Some of you, your soul needs healing. And the good shepherd says, I, I want to help heal your soul. I want to replenish your soul, refresh your soul. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. He guides me. So he's like a, like a GPS like a GPS system that helps me know where to go. He guides me. And I, I, I struggle with this because I, I'm not a big, like, God guides every single decision kind of person. I struggle with, well, sometimes he just gives you the freedom to choose, right? Like, did you, like, look at your jean collection this morning and, like, God guide me? Like, which one? Do I need to wear the black ones or do I need to wear the high-waist ones, the skinny ones? Like, what, where, God lead me? You probably didn't. You were just like, oh, those would look, like, I, I, I'm feeling those. I ate too much last night. I'm going to get with these because they're a little baggier. Like, whatever. But there are some decisions where you really pray about it and you seek him. And there are times when he actually leads our decisions through the power of his Holy Spirit, the personal nature of his spirit living inside of those who have put their faith in him. He guides our steps. It's this way, not this way, this way, not this way. But it takes us letting him do that. It takes us submitting to him, saying, hey, I'm giving you access and I'm giving you the authority to guide me. Would you guide my soul? Would you guide my steps? But he doesn't do it to make us great. He doesn't do it for us to look better. He guides us for his name's sake, for his glory, for his honor, that other people might know him. That's why he does it. And then we get to that part that some of you are like, wait, I've heard that line before. Like the translation I just read, even though I walked through the darkest valley, the other translation is, as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You remember that? And some of you are like, who? I, I've heard that before. And some of you maybe are even thinking, oh, did David get this from Coolio? From Gangsta's Paradise? From Dangerous Minds, the movie, you know, you remember? As I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I take a look at my life and realize there's nothing left because I've been blasting and laughing so long that even my mama thinks that my mind is gone. But I ain't ever... Some of you, um, some of you don't know Coolio, and honestly, it shows. <laughs> it shows, okay? But others of you, uh, you are children of the 90s, and that song was your anthem like it was my anthem. I was like this goofy white middle school kid walking around rapping Kulu like I was hard, like I was gangster. You know, I, didn't, I couldn't even spell it. I mean, I was like, anyway, I was like, Coolio didn't get that. Um, Coolio didn't originate those lyrics, right? I mean, Coolio got that from David. David, David penned these words that as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though I walk through the valley. Now, here's what's tricky is notice what he says is that he says that we that the good shepherd makes us lie down. But then he says, sometimes we get into to a valley and he wants us to walk. And sometimes we get that confused. Sometimes we walk through the green pastures and lie down in the valley. And maybe some of you right now, you feel like you're in a valley 
and it feels discouraging and you feel like I can't, I don't know up from down. I don't know which way is forward. I'm confused. I feel alone. I feel insecure. I feel inadequate. This feels like a valley and no one likes the valley because we love the mountaintop. We love when, when we're up top and we can see everything and we've got the purview and the perspective to know which way is up and which way is north and where, where God is. But in the valley, it's cold, it's desolate, it's lonely, and we feel like, God, you're absent, you're distant, I don't feel you, I don't know that you're there. And sometimes the discouragement of the valley causes us to lie down in the valley and we stay there and God's going, listen, I am with you in the valley. I'm right there with you. And there are times when I will carry you through the valley, but more times than not, I need you to get up on your feet and to walk through the valley. One step in front of the other, to put one foot in front of the other foot and walk through the valley. If you're in a season of discouragement, tell somebody about it. If you're in a season of discouragement, stand up and fix your eyes on him, even if you can't see him. Say, God, I don't even know which way you are, but I am trusting you and I'm looking to you. And then you put a foot in front of the other and you walk and you do the next right thing. Maybe it means you get up and you go to work tomorrow. Maybe it means you get up tomorrow and you call somebody. Maybe it means you get up tomorrow and you go get some help. But When you're in the valley, and if you feel like you're lying down, this word might just be from David, from God, from God's spirit to us to say, don't lay down in the valley. If you want to get there, you got to walk through it. You got to walk through the valley, even when it's hard. Don't walk through the green pastures and lay down in the valley. Come on now, lay down in the green pastures and walk through the valley. Why? Because he's with us. This is what David said. Because I know you're with me. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Does he say, I will fear no evil because there's nothing to be afraid of? No. See, there is stuff to be afraid of. It's a wild and woolly world out there, right? You got a boss that's frustrating. You got some situations in your family that are complicated. You got an addiction that feels like it's a, just a decision or two away. There's stuff to be afraid of, but he doesn't say, don't fear. There's nothing to be afraid of. Sometimes our kids will come up and wake us up in the middle of the night and say, um, I've had a bad dream or I heard a noise or I think something's under my bed. That's the worst, you know? And whenever they do that, I'm like, no, there probably is. Just go back to bed. You'll be fine. There probably is something under your bed. Yeah. No, I, I don't say, hey, listen, like there's, there's nothing to be afraid of because, I mean, we live in Atlanta. So, I mean, there is some stuff to be afraid of. You know what I mean? Like we got some crime, you know? So, so do y'all. I mean, there is some stuff. No, but what we try to teach them is, hey, there is a God who's bigger than everything there is to be afraid of. The God, our God is so big that he gives the stuff that we're afraid of something to be afraid of. And so I'm not telling you don't be afraid because there's nothing to be afraid of. I'm telling you, you don't have to be afraid because he is with you. He's with you. He holds your hand in the valley. He carries us at times through the valley. His presence is power in the valley. And so even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil because he is with me. His rod, your rod and your staff, they come for me. I I told you already, like, I don't know about sheep, okay? So I don't know why we use the the, the rod and why we use the staff, but evidently one of them, the rod represents uh, the, the, the way the shepherd sometimes has to beat off the evil to keep the sheep protected, and, and commentators have said this, this represents God's power, that God is powerful enough to protect you. He's powerful enough for you to trust him. He's that kind of shepherd. But he has this staff, you know, that has this, this, this uh, hook on the end of it. And there are times that the sheep get off, off course. And, and the, the good shepherd will take the staff and will pull the sheep back on course. That not only does he have the power of a good shepherd, but he has the graciousness of a good shepherd, to get us back on track. That's who he is. He's all powerful, but he's so personable and gracious, and he loves us through 
the valley. He says, I, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And then look at what he says. This is more like you got to know sheep, right? But you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. So this is like him taunting the enemy. Shame, loneliness, guilt, discouragement. He prepares this beautiful table to say, hey, I just want to let you know that this sheep is with me. And, and this sheep is not yours. You do not have any right over this sheep, but I am going to provide for this sheep even in the middle of what feels like trouble, what feels like danger right there in the presence of the enemy. And you anoint my head with oil. Sometimes sheep uh, supposedly will get up into stuff and they'll stick their head in, in somewhere looking for something because they smelled something and they'll scratch their head up. And the good, loving, kind shepherd will take oil and will come and anoint this sheep and, and will take this oil and will soothe the sheep's head. Maybe some of you need that from your loving father today. Maybe you've been in some trouble. Maybe it's been a weekend. Maybe it's been a rough week. and Maybe you feel battered and bruised and scraped and scratched. And you have a shepherd who says, I want to come and Heal your wounds. I want to come and bandage your abrasions. I want to come and help you in the way that you can't help yourself. And that's what he does. He lovingly comforts his sheep. He does it with oil. He does it with his kindness. He does it with his presence and so David's overwhelmed, and he goes, and so I, my, my, my cup, my proverbial cup, it, it's running over. I, I'm so full. I, I, I have so much because I have him. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. And then I love this next word. He says, surely, In light of all of that, in light of who he is and all that he can do, surely, I mean, for sure, 100%, 1,000%, I mean, it's got to be true that if he is who he says he is, then surely your goodness, that surely your goodness and love like two sheep dogs that are running behind the pack, keeping all the sheep together. Surely your goodness and your love will follow me all the days of my life. All the days. And I will be with you. I will get to be in the house of the Lord forever. Meaning there is nothing, no one, no circumstance, no obstacle that can come in the way of the shepherd and his sheep. That it is letting us know that, hey, from here until eternity, that I have taken on the enemy and I have defeated the enemy so that we can be together in communion, in union with intimacy for eternity. And that's what he's promised to us. Even when we're in the valley, he says, my relationship with you, your relationship with the shepherd, it's so secure that nothing, no one, no obstacle, no circumstance can get in the way. So you just keep your eyes on the shepherd. You just decide, you know what? I'm going to make the shepherd, I'm going to make the shepherd my shepherd. He's not just going to be the shepherd or a shepherd. He's going to be my shepherd. So the, the offer, the invitation today is, a simple invitation. It's an invitation of trust. Have you trusted him as your shepherd? I, you might have heard Psalm 23 before. Maybe it was read at a wedding or maybe it was read, God forbid, at the funeral you went to. But have you trusted him? Is it personal? Have you trusted him as your shepherd? When you pray to him, do you say, you are my shepherd? And though I feel like there's a lot that I lack, I know that I lack nothing when I have you. If I have you, I have everything. And if I don't feel like there's something that I have that I need, it's because I don't need it yet. But if I have you, I have it all. 
Uh, I, I still don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life, y'all. So I don't know if some of you are like, you know, so what's the end of the story? You know, so then you got this like big killer job and, you know, no, uh, I'm unemployed. So um, if you're looking for like success in life, you know, listen to Ben's next sermon, you know, but if you're, if you're at a place where you're like, I, I don't know what's next, I'm right there with you. I don't know. I mean, I've got some ideas and I have some dreams and some hopes and some things that I want to do, but I, 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 I still feel like I am in a season where God, I, I don't know. I don't know exactly what is next. There's this little story that um, I've been hanging on to, this little prayer that someone sent me in the middle of this season. I just thought, well, there it is. There it is. That, that's it. So I, I want to tell it to you because maybe this is you. Um, supposedly there was this gentleman, this American businessman who his dream was to get to go and work in Calcutta with Mother Teresa. And so the, the opportunity came where he got the chance to step away from his job for a couple of months. He was in a season of transition and he got to go work with Mother Teresa and was working alongside of some other people working with her and eventually got into a space where they had the opportunity one day to be able to pray together. And Mother Teresa lovingly, kindly, warmly looks at him and says, sir, we're so grateful that you came over here to serve. How can I pray for you? And he said, well, I've got all these things back in America that when I get back, some decisions I've got to make and I, 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 I don't know what I need to be doing. I don't know exactly what's next. And if you would, would you pray that God would give me clarity? Some of you, that's what you've been praying for, which is great. Clarity is a great prayer. But supposedly Mother Teresa looked at him and said, sir, I have asked God for clarity and he has never given it to me. So if it's okay with you, what I will pray for you is that God will give you opportunities to trust him. When you don't have clarity, I'm gonna pray that God would give you an opportunity to trust him. And some of you today, you're in a season where you want clarity so bad. God, show me what's next. God, make it clear to me what's next. And God's going, I want to so bad, but I am trying to grow something in you. I'm trying to develop something in you that couldn't be developed any other way. And you're in a season, a season where he's given you this opportunity, this exercise, to trust him. And as hard as it is, as painful as it may be, my prayer for you today is that you would trust him, the good shepherd. 